Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. I want to show you something. Take a look at this cover photo and these inside. What beautiful shots. Now, how much time goes into capturing these images and who are the lucky folks who do this for a living? As any editor will tell you, wildlife photography is a very competitive business and those who are talented enough to make a living at it must possess enormous amounts of patience, persistence, and discipline. A healthy knowledge of wild animals and their habits helps a lot too. In our first story tonight, we'll introduce you to Ron Spomer, the photographer who took these pictures. He has all the required qualities and more, including, as you'll see, a rather wacky sense of humor. Sort of called a floating muskrat blind, yet the idea is that uh, it will imitate a, a muskrat hut. Came up with the idea of putting a dome that would mimic a muskrat hut over a float tube, and that way you could rather inconspicuously float amongst the waterfowl. Well, you know, sometimes it actually is worse than not having one, and this might be one of those occasions. On some ponds, I've uh, gone in where waterfowl was fairly acclimated to, to people as they are here, and float around in a tube, and they ignore you because they think you're a fisherman, and you put the blind on, and they act like something from Mars has just landed, and the whole lake empties with us screaming and honking and splashing and flapping. So uh, we, may, we may be disappointed here, but I want to work some ruddy ducks that live on this lake, and when they first come up in in the spring, they're a little bit shy yet. Uh, right here. Ha, you'll never see me coming. Quack, 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 quack. I figure if you look like a duck and you feel like a duck, you might as well talk like a duck. Quack, quack. Oh, look, someone left a camera on the dock. I could use one of those. Oh. Stealth photographer. Patience and persistence, you have to keep at it. You've got to be patient until the lighting is right and your subjects are right. You have to be, be persistent in pursuing that. And then you have to have either a natural eye or a developed eye for composition and beauty. And as quite often you'll find something half hidden in the cattails, cleaning, sitting on a log or something. And if you just go blundering by, you'll miss your opportunity. So I check things out carefully before I go, and then I turn around and put the old flippers into action and head for the backwaters. A lot of people think when they go to photograph wildlife, they're photographing animals or birds or snakes or, or whatever the subject matter is. And I tell students in my workshops, you don't photograph things, you photograph light. It's reflected light. And you can have the world's most, the world's largest deer or elk, for instance, in your viewfinder. And if you've got ugly light, you're gonna have an ugly picture, no matter how big it is. You might have a record. There's this elk, the biggest one anyone's ever photographed, but it's not gonna necessarily be a beautiful picture. It's light that makes the image, reflected light. I've got uh, a wood duck I photographed on a pond that was reflecting autumn colors. And the pond is, is orange and bronze and yellow and, and red, and it's just gorgeous, the color in it. And of course, the wood duck is so colorful. And the two together seem to work really well, and uh, that shot has, has done fairly well for me. I've had a couple of magazine covers with it and a calendar cover and a number of things. Right. There's probably about 10 to a dozen ruddies, one scop and one bufflehead. Both drakes. It starts off as fun. It's like hunting or fishing. You want to be outdoors. You want to be with wildlife. You want to sneak up on it. You want to see it in its secret world, doing things that you don't normally see. And it's thrilling. It's exciting. It's uh, it's all of the all the reasons that most people get involved in in wildlife in one form or another. But once you decide to start making money at it and turn it into a business, you have to treat it as a business. And the upshot is you spend more time in the office going over slides over a light table, filing slides, going to the computer, finding markets, convincing people to use your stuff, 
sending out submissions, logging submissions in again. Uh, I spend more time in the office than I do outdoors. You know, I started off spending more time out photographing, but once you get a collection, several tens of thousands of slides in the file, it's time to start selling them. You can take more and more and more, and you, you just really can't make a living that way unless you get them out there for buyers to see. Coming in for a landing. Oh, it also helps to be a masochist in this business. You must love to suffer cold, heat, mosquitoes, dampness, dryness. Excruciating muscle pain, excruciating. I thought I'd be out fishing and hunting and writing stories about that, but uh, I never imagined I'd be in Idaho for one thing. I always dreamed about getting to the Rocky Mountains and seeing all those wonderful things I'd read about. Can't explain it, just a natural interest. It's, it's like uh, I think of Aldo Leopold's old line about you can do without golf, but who could live without goose music? It's just something inside of me that it, uh, it makes me that interesting. I've been like that ever since I was a kid. I just had a fascination for it. I think that's the way it is with most people who are interested in wildlife. You're, you're either naturally attracted to it, and you find it fascinating, or who cares? I heard subject matter, gosh, I don't know, that's a tough one. I'd probably have to go with birds. I've always been fascinated with birds, even though I'm a hunter and I love uh, mammals, big game animals. Um, I don't know, day in and day out, the color, I think, of birds. And, and the, the fact that they're awake and diurnal, you don't have to be sneaking around at the edge of night hoping to have enough light to get a picture of them. They're out all day and they're colorful and they're mating uh, rituals and annex and dances and they're just such a variety with birds. You need to know when they're moving, times of day, seasons. For instance, the red-winged blackbirds right now, uh, in a, uh, maybe three weeks now, they'll start nesting and they're real territorial and you can paddle within oh, 10 feet of them and they will remain on their territory. They might complain about you being there and then when you get too close, you know it's time to back off. But usually if we're in, oh, say 20 feet, 10 to 20 feet of a bird the size of a red-winged blackbird with a large lens, you can get a pretty good image. ethics when you're outdoors. The uh, photographer ideally should be invisible to his subject. It rarely happens. Wildlife is just too sharp for that. They hear you, they smell you, they see you, they know you're there. But wild animals also have uh, a knack for knowing when something is dangerous and when it isn't. They have a, a flight distance. And if you know their behavior and watch them closely, you can detect when they're becoming nervous and when you're disrupting them and need to back off. Study their, their times and their patterns and then set up a blind. Sometimes it might take two weeks of moving a blind uh, slowly closer to position to get everything just right. It's a long and uh, it would be tedious except for there's so many interesting things going on all the time. It's rarely tedious. Occasionally boring while you wait. Sometimes you may sit in a blind for eight hours at a crack. But um, once the wildlife shows up, things start to happen. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep them doggies rolling rawhide. Throw in the rain and weather. Hell bent for leather, wishing this goose was by my side. And all the film I'm wasting, good vittles I should be tasting if I just stayed home and had breakfast. Hit them up, move them out, raw film. Shoot them out, blast them out, crank them out, click them out. Waste all that raw film. We're attempting to, to aid in the recovery of these fish by means of enforcement. 
Our next story is about a whole different kind of photography. Do you remember seeing the eerie video taken by the infrared night vision cameras during Operation Desert Storm? Well, that advanced technology is just one of the tools being used by a special law enforcement team to videotape poachers operating under the cover of darkness. And uh, so many of our bad guys operate at night. You could use this and sit there and, and photograph him in, in almost total darkness. The camera is a regular eight millimeter camcorder, but the special lens attachment allows enforcement officers to take video like this. This video was shot to observe people's responses to an artificial deer set up near a road where there had been reports of illegal shootings. But the main use of the equipment is to stop the unlawful take of salmon and steelhead. Fish and Game Conservation Officer Eldon Anglin is part of a special enforcement team funded by the Bonneville Power Administration, or BPA. Their goal was to double salmon enforcement in the Columbia River Basin. As a result, 34 field officers were added to Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and tribal fishery enforcement ranks. We're attempting to, to aid in the recovery of these fish by means of enforcement. And uh, unfortunately, Idaho is getting so few back now that it's really, you know, it's really tough to even find a fish. But down the river, the enforcement effort has been a tremendous help. And a number of arrests once a BPA program came online just skyrocketed and then prey. BPA funding also helped pay for this jet boat, a custom design model especially built to handle the rugged rapids of the Salmon River. It took me, I'd say, 50 engine hours, which is a clock that's on the engine, you know, before I felt where I could relax a little bit. And you don't dare relax. You've got to keep an eye on the river all the time. And something like this rainstorm we're having obscures your vision as to what you're looking at that water and it's like looking at a, a roadway. The river is the roadway in this spectacular canyon. And we've got a stretch of river here without any road on it. So people can enjoy and a little less pressure on some of the resources. It's a, it's a particularly this, this canyon from here on is a real beautiful canyon very rough, some of the best rapids in the river. For almost 25 years, this soft-spoken man has been protecting our state's wildlife for the people of Idaho. He says it's been a good experience, and he's found that most folks are pleased to know that he's out here keeping tabs on the resource. Yeah, I'm eight months from retirement now, and uh, I'm going out with a real positive attitude. I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm doing a good job. I feel like I'm doing something for the resource, to aid the resource. I feel like that, uh, something that, if we don't do something pretty quick, we're not going to have the resource. Just having a having a good time, uh, coming out to take the kids out fishing, so do a little bit for uh, Earth Day, and they'll pick up some trash. Take one of the most prolific game fish in the state, add in a bit of good old-fashioned competition, and hint at the promise of tasty food. Then you have the makings of a great day in Idaho's outdoors. Welcome to the South Fork Whitefish Derby. Okay. Well, we've always enjoyed being outdoors and uh, having an event like this where you can uh, go outdoors and take the whole family out. It's, uh, it's a real nice thing. The Whitefish Derby is just a handy excuse to do what Art and Sarah Jensen love to do anyway. Take the kids Jason, Ember, and Austin and go fishing. Several years ago, they were stationed here while Art was in the military. At the time, they promised themselves that someday they would return to the Idaho Falls area to live. The dream came true, and nowadays you're likely to find them right here along the shoreline of the South Fork of the Snake River, fishing rods in hand. There hasn't been anything rising on the river, and uh, 
Haven't been taking any of the nymphs I've been putting out. I've been uh, using little peacocks, half the uh, soft tackle, and little uh, beadhead uh, nymphs, and uh, haven't had any luck yet. But like I said, yet. We'll see how it goes today. <laughs> A few yards upriver, father and son team Doug and Greg Seipert are running into the same thing. It's pretty tough to win a derby prize if you don't catch a fish, but they aren't about to give up yet. Okay, what we're going to do is put the weight below the nymph and fish the nymph up a little ways in the water. So we'll put the weight down here, have the nymph up here on a dropper. 12-year-old Greg is just beginning to learn the intricacies of casting with a fly rod. It's a challenge to master the skill, and today's gusting wind doesn't make it any easier. You have to use both hands to cast with, remember. The idea behind the Whitefish Derby is to introduce people to a great resource that is often neglected. Many of the state's streams are closed to trout fishing in the spring, but that doesn't mean you should shelve your spinning gear or fly rod. Whitefish have their own general season. They may not be as glamorous as a rainbow trout, but this close cousin can put up quite a fight. Are we going to take it? Yeah, we'll take it into the derby. Got to cook it up for somebody. These are about 14 inches. There's nothing like success to inspire fellow anglers. Six-year-old Ember decides to see if any of her dad's luck has rubbed off on her. Okay. I can't really throw that far. Well, if you teach your kids early how to fish and how to take care of the environment, then they'll be uh, doing it all their life. And uh, they'll teach their kids, and they'll be you know, good stewards of the land and help take care of the environment. Uh, teach them not to, uh, not to waste fish, if, just take what they need. And uh, most of the time, we just fish for catch and release, just fish for the fun of it. Baby brother Austin looks on placidly as Ember scampers off to collect track along with prizes for the largest fish, is a prize for the angler who brings in the biggest load of litter. A pair of anglers in a drift boat show off their catch of the day, a big, beautiful cutthroat trout, and then float lazily on down the river in pursuit of more. Four-year-old Chandler Smith has no interest in capturing the prize for the largest whitefish. He and his special Mickey Mouse pull are after something well, else. The most thing I want to catch is a rainbow fish. A no white fish? No, a rainbow fish. And how does one go about that? Tell me how, how you catch a fish. What? How do you catch a fish? Um, you need worms and a fishing pole and string and things that make the, no, um, the, the little things right here that makes it sink go under deep. This is exactly what the organizer of the derby, fishing game biologist Mark Gamblin, wants to see. A little guy like Chandler Smith learning all about the great fun that can be had in Idaho's outdoors. Another thing we try to do with these types of, of promotional activities is to get kids brought into the fishing tradition. And, uh, show kids that there's some real good positive um, pursuits that they can get involved in that uh, I think contribute to society and make for a better community and hopefully will foster an appreciation for our wildlife heritage and our natural resources. And Mark's day began early, setting up the Ryrie Senior Citizen Center for the feast to come. But the anglers didn't disappoint him. A little after noon, fish began arriving by the bucket full to be measured and weighed. Yep, this one puts them at a pound and a quarter. Inside, Mark is busy filleting fish, surrounded by an intent audience of wide-eyed little anglers. Fourteen different whitefish recipes are featured from smoked to boiled. And the general consensus seems to be that this often maligned fish actually tastes pretty good. It's real good. It's uh, white fish in a beer batter. Just like most things, it really does depend on how you prepare white fish and using the right recipes and the right techniques 
Um, I think, as you've seen today, there are some people that are really quite surprised at how well they can taste. Thanks for joining us. We'll close tonight with a look at next month's show, when Incredible Idaho takes you to eastern Idaho, where the world's largest nesting concentration of greater sandhill cranes build their nests among the bulrushes and cattails of Gray's Lake. <laughs>